Good morning, I'm Adam Sexton. Just a few short weeks ago, the bailouts and stimulus legislation from a decade ago stood as the monumental emergency spending bills of this century, the likes of which we thought we might never see again. But now, they've been dwarfed by the $2 trillion CARES Act, Washington's double-barrel response to the coronavirus pandemic. And this might just be an opening salvo in a long and costly battle. Here to discuss this morning in what we believe is a close-up first via live stream is Senator Maggie Hassan from Washington. Thank you for joining us, Senator. Thanks for having me, Adam. I hope you are safe and well. Likewise. And uh, let's start by having you explain why you stayed in D.C. In this strange time, care equals distance, and you have someone very close to you whose health must right. be protected. Right. So I am self-isolating here in D.C., having been uh, active on the Hill for the few weeks leading up to this. Uh, I was advised by our doctors, our family doctors, that it would be best for me to stay here for 14 days and self-isolate because, as I think most of your viewers know, uh, Tom and I have a, a wonderful son, Ben, who lives with us in New Hampshire, who happens to be a high-risk person. He has complex medical needs and a very comprom compromised respiratory system. So the last thing I want to do is bring this virus into our household. So I'm self-isolating here in D.C., uh, getting my exercise every day, but otherwise not going out. And we certainly wish you and Ben and the family well uh, in this difficult time. Before we jump into the coronavirus aid package, let's talk a little bit about something that unfolded this last week with the Treasury Department uh, looking to require uh, Social Security recipients to file a tax return in order to get this emergency aid that's going to people. Uh, you know, the legislative branch appropriated this money. Why isn't the Treasury Department just pushing it out as fast as possible? Well, that's what they need to be doing. And just so that your viewers know, part of our package was really focused on getting direct cash assistance to individuals as quickly as possible, understanding the unprecedented impact that this stay at home life we're all living right now would have on the economy and on the workforce. And so Social Security recipients, retirees and those with uh, SSDI uh, are part of this uh, package. And we specifically said in the legislation to Treasury, just get the money out. You have everything on record for Social Security recipients that you need to have to get the money out to them. Then earlier this week, they said uh, they were going to make Social Security recipients file a tax return to get the payment that was directly counter what we intended and what we said in the law. So uh, I pushed the Treasury and IRS along with Senator Brown. We led a letter uh, just a few days ago. And the good news is that Treasury reversed itself and now says that that money will go directly out to those on Social Security retirement and disability without them having to do anything um, unless there's another reason for them to file a tax return. Is there a sense of when they'll be able to get that money? Uh, Within a couple of weeks, if they have direct deposit, it takes longer if they usually get checks. And right now, one of the things we're doing is pushing Treasury as hard as we can to speed up the process for getting checks or uh, even open up a portal so people could put information in to get direct deposit. So there's a lot yet to be done, uh, but for people who already have direct deposit information with the IRS uh, or Social Security, uh, they should be getting those payments uh, within a couple of weeks. In terms of the act itself, some of these numbers are just staggering here, about $340 billion to states and local governments, $560 billion to individuals, $377 billion for small businesses, which makes this question sound kind of crazy. Is it going to be enough? Well, that's one of the things we're watching. This is obviously an unprecedented hit to our economy. Uh, first things first, we have to stay healthy, and the health of our people and the health of our economy are directly related. So there's no way around this. we got to do the social distancing that is so critically important to slow the spread of this disease and keep it from overwhelming our hospitals and our healthcare workforce, among other things. But the really critical question now is as we get the direct cash assistance to individuals, as we get loans to small businesses, and these are loans that are intended to support businesses that keep their workers on payroll. So if they keep most of their workforce on, the loan will be forgiven. Uh, as we expand unemployment insurance, uh, it now will uh, be available to self-employed and gig workers uh, during this four-month period uh, and will come with an extra $600 a week during this four-month period. As we do that and get direct 
cash assistance to our hospitals and to our state and local governments. We're going to have to be watching whether, in fact, it is enough. We have to keep injecting resources into this economy, especially to the front lines of families, individuals, and the healthcare system and state and local governments so that we can tackle the health crisis, but keep cash flowing in the economy at some level to keep us moving forward. Take us inside some of the legislative wrangling that went on last month. There was a point at which Republicans were accusing Democrats of obstructing this bill that needed to get out so quickly. Well, what was really important to me was that we make sure that as we were giving very large loans and, and cash assistance to major industry groups like the airlines or hotel industry, that we were also protecting workers and making sure that workers and individuals would have some resources um, available to them as they're grappling with the impact of losing a job and not knowing where the next rent payment or um, grocery payment is going to come from, right? So we felt very strongly that the first draft proposal uh, that uh, the Republican leader, uh, Senator McConnell, put out simply didn't have um, enough assistance and protections for the workforce and for the health care system, uh, as well as uh, state and local governments. So we really said, you know, this is a good start, but it's not going to do enough for people on the front lines, for families, for individuals, for our most vulnerable, like people on Social Security. And so we had to go a couple of rounds of negotiations and voting to say that what was being proposed wasn't enough, uh, but we got there. And then we came together and we passed a bipartisan, unanimous uh, bill. It passed out of the Senate unanimously. And it's really critically important assistance uh, to the front lines, to our individuals and families, to our small businesses, uh, to our hospitals and state and local governments. Uh, and it may, in fact, be something that we have to follow up on because, again, what's going to be important is following the advice of health experts as they look at the data and look at how this virus travels and when it surges, that's got to inform when we can begin to reopen the economy and get back uh, to something approaching normal uh, where we don't have to uh, have as much assistance go to the front lines. And an aside here within the Senate chamber, what should be the appropriate next step, do you think, regarding these allegations of insider trading that some of your colleagues are facing, particularly Senator Kelly Leffler, uh, who has the stock portfolio that, uh, you know, she says that she was not making the decisions, but somehow her portfolio dumped exactly the right stocks before this happened and bought exactly the right stocks before this happened. So what should be the next step? Well, uh, as I understand it, there are investigations going on uh, through the SEC and possibly through the Department of Justice uh, on her trade, as well as I think it was Senator Burr's as well. This is very important. Our job is to represent the public uh, and make sure uh, that we are focused on their needs. And it's also very important for the public to have confidence in us and the motivation and reasons we're making the decisions we're making. So um, I think the investigations are appropriate. I'll wait to hear what the results of those investigations are. Uh, but this is one of the reasons, of course, that uh, Congress passed an act uh, that um, prevents uh, insider trading by members of Congress. And I certainly think it's important uh, for members of Congress uh, to consider just not investing in individual stocks. What about the uninsured right now? If someone without insurance and very little money ends up in one of these two-week ICU stays, intubated, uh, comes out and is going to need recovery time, uh, how are we going to ensure that that person isn't essentially buried under a mountain of debt? This is one of the things that we are working to address right now, and it's one of the reasons that many of us believe um, another legislative package is going to be needed. Look, we have never been more aware of the importance of affordable, quality health care for all of our people than we are doing during this unprecedented pandemic. And the last thing people need is to be surprised by a bill for a diagnostic test for the virus or um, overwhelmed by surprise medical bills because they got hospitalized or sent to a hospital that isn't in their insurance network or didn't have insurance to begin with. So a couple of things. We have asked the administration to open a special enrollment period for those who don't have insurance right now so that they can get insurance during this pandemic. The administration has refused to do that, which is unacceptable. We'll keep pushing. They also continue to pursue their lawsuit that would invalidate 
the entire Affordable Care Act, undermining health care for millions of Americans. And we'll keep pushing them to reverse that. In the meantime, we are also pushing health insurers to not only cover the diagnostic testing without any copays, but also to make sure that they are covering treatment, not just for those with a positive test result because not everybody who has the illness can get tested right now. We don't have enough testing, but for presumptive cases of COVID-19 as well. A couple of insurers have come forward and said that they will follow that protocol. Uh, we are going to keep pushing to make sure uh, as best we can that all insurers follow that. How would you rate President Trump's handling of this pandemic so far? Look, uh, I think that the administration was slow to respond with the level of urgency they need to. Um, I think we need to do much more to get personal protective equipment out to the front lines and make sure we have enough ventilators. And I have been pushing, the whole delegation pushed along with Governor Sununu, uh, the president to do more with the Defense Production Act so we could marshal the manufacturing resources of the whole country, ramp up production, and then distribute it, allocate it to the places that need it most. But the time for the after action report on this will be once we are in the recovery mode. Right now, we all have to come together and do what we need to do to keep each other healthy and then um, help the people who get sick, make sure our hospitals, our frontline healthcare workers have the resources they need and make sure that we're stabilizing the economy as best we can to get through this together. We will, we are resilient and we are strong. Uh, America has been through very hard things before. We're gonna get through this. Um, and then we will have a time to look at what we learned um, in this instance and prepare in ways to ensure that uh, we never get caught flat-footed again. And you sit on the Homeland Security Committee. What are some of the experts and top analysts telling you about how long this is potentially going to last? Look, um, the experts have a variety of models, um, but I think what you heard when the president extended the stay-at-home guidelines through April 30th is that we have got uh, multiple weeks to go here. This is going to depend in part on how successful we are at flattening that curve, slowing the spread of this illness. What's really important for people to remember, as frustrating as this can be, uh, it's not like Americans to be asked to respond to a crisis by staying home, right? But that's what we need to do because since we can spread this virus without even having symptoms ourselves, um, we know that if we're out and about, we can be spreading the virus quickly. That creates a surge for the people who are most at risk in our hospitals. That overwhelms the hospital system, not only for the people who need treatment because of COVID-19, but it may make it harder for people with other kinds of medical emergencies to get the treatment they need. So this is about keeping each other healthy, keeping our hospitals functional so that they can treat people with medical emergencies, whatever the cause. And that's critically important for our economy too. So that's why people keep hearing us say, stay home when you do need to go out, socially distance and make sure that you're washing your hands, that if you, and hard surfaces like cell phones and doorknobs. Um, and lastly, if you do get symptoms, a cough, a fever, flu-like symptoms, call your doctor. There's much more telehealth going on now than there was a few weeks ago. Stay home unless you are instructed uh, to go to a healthcare facility or obviously unless you have urgent symptoms like shortness of breath. Uh, really important though, uh, to do our best to stay home whenever we can. Uh, that's the best way to take care of our loved ones right now. Okay, Senator Hassan, thanks so much for joining us on Close Up. We hope you remain in good health and Ben and the rest of your family as well. Thank you, you too. Everybody stay safe, stay well. We're gonna get through this just fine.